Welcome to a more beautiful life collective. We know that in the hectic hurry of everyday life, it's easy to lose sight of what really matters. This is a moment to pause and realign your focus on the one who gives us peace and rest. We are focusing on discipleship, productivity, and homemaking as we live with eternity in mind. This is the place where you'll learn to create a life you love and cultivate your heart for God. Hey everyone, and welcome back to a more beautiful life collective podcast. This is episode eight of season one, and I'm so excited to be back with you this week. Don't forget to leave a five-star rating and review of the podcast wherever you're listening to help the podcast reach more listeners. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and the blog at morebeautifullifecollective.com. Now on to the episode. Our church just had an awesome camp out this weekend at one of our local state parks. So this is one of the reasons why the episode is a little bit late um, coming out. For several years, we've been heading to this park on Sunday mornings for service, followed by a picnic. And this is always a lovely day. It's one of my favorite days of the year. Um, The weather is just beginning to cool down here in South Carolina. And it's just so great to be together and enjoy God's creation together. And so this year, we actually did something a little bit different. We added a camp out uh, to the weekend. So we uh, got together and all went camping, either in tents or in campers. And there's just something so special when you carve out time to get away from everything going on with your family and friends. And on the podcast, that's one of the things that we talk about. We talk about pausing and recentering our lives and our minds on God. And so a weekend like this is the epitome of what we've been talking about. There's a certain amount of realignment that happens, and it can only occur when you stop racing through every day, trying to get everything that you need to done. I've been blessed throughout my life to have these pausing moments sprinkled throughout my year. Since I was young, that has just kind of been built into our church calendar. And throughout the year, we've had these times that just punctuate the year. They give me something to look forward to as I go through the mundane mundane tasks of homework, chores, and daily routines. Now, I'm not Catholic, if that's what you're thinking, or even Anglican. Sometimes we hear this uh, this term, church calendar, and we think of, you know, more uh, liturgical churches. But I, I'm talking about like a literal calendar of events um, from a church calendar, including things like VBS and church camps and fall festivals and Christmas programs. Things like these can be small. And they could seem kind of even childish, like you think of a fall festival or a children's program. But as a child, these moments were annual moments of Sabbath rest, and they helped pull me out of hurry, and they helped point me to the gospel. When I was young, these moments helped to form and shape me into somebody who looks for God in the everyday. Because throughout the year, I had special events that reminded me that God was in the everyday. I wanted to seek the kingdom of God, but sometimes I struggled with how to seek the kingdom of God. And these things helped to realign my focus onto that very thing. And in my teen years, these events, it wasn't that they were diminished in value. Actually, they were kind of magnified. I found friendships in these events, ideas and truths that sustained me and taught me and developed me into the person I am now. We would always have worship and classes and lots of time just to be together. And reading books on child formation development, it helps me realize that not only were these events good for my spiritual development, they were also good for just me and my physical development growing up, uh, having these camps and events that shaped me into a healthier and more capable person. We would always come away from these events. We would have discussions about, you know, what was going on. And one of the ideas that we would always have is that these times together were a glimpse of the kingdom. It's what we hope for, what we know that eternity will be like having the time for worship and food, fellowship, learning, just being with one another. All of this is what we long for. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has set eternity in the hearts and minds of man. We know and yearn for this future spent together with God. And so I would always come away uh, growing up from these church retreats ready to live on a mission for him. But if you've ever done something similar, you know that life has a way of dulling your passions and muting your dreams and deadening your senses. With sin in the world, life has a way of beating down your will to live. We've been called to live abundantly, 
Eternity is on our hearts and we live with it in mind. And so this should change every aspect of how we live. Matthew 6, 33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. One of our primary goals in life should be to seek the kingdom of God over everything else. In this chapter where Jesus was speaking, it was nestled in the Sermon on the Mount. And so Jesus is teaching his disciples about what the primary focus of their lives should be. Like the seed in the parable of the sower, he knew that the worries and cares of this life could easily be choked, could easily choke out the good fruit that could be produced by the seed. And he told them, you don't need to be anxious about things. You don't need to be anxious about food or clothing or anything else that money can buy. God knows that we need these things. And so he's going to make sure that we're provided for accordingly. Instead, what we're told to do is just to seek first the kingdom of God. And so this is what got me thinking this weekend. You know, we talk about these moments as being something that is a glimpse of the kingdom. And we know that we're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God. And it just got me thinking about how can we do this in our life? I think the world expects us to seek first our own needs. It's in direct contradiction to what Jesus was talking about whenever he said, look, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else that you need will be given to you. I think one of the basic tenets of this idea of like social Darwinism, survival of the fittest, one of the basic tenets of social Darwinism is this idea that if we're doing well, we will provide for our needs first and thus get ahead of everyone else. I think the world expects us to want to provide for our own needs first. We're expected to do well in school so that we can get into a good college, so we can get a good job and have the luxuries that we could ever want. I think the American dream, it's not necessarily a white picket fence anymore with, you know, 2.5 kids. But I think the American dream is to have a college degree and to have, um, you know, a prosperous career and to have uh, a good work-life balance where you don't have to work all the time, but you can still have all the things that you need to make you feel uh, successful and to have like a luxurious life. And I think that this is something that the world is saying, this is what we want. This is what we should pursue. Even In some churches, we have this false teaching, and it's the prosperity gospel, where some Christians believe that if you check all the boxes and do all the right things, you're going to be rewarded now, that you will have a prosperous life now as a reward for this right living. And reading through this verse, this might be something that you walk away with, that if you seek first the kingdom of God, everything will be added unto you. And you think, well, maybe if I if I do all these right things and check off the right boxes, then I'm going to have this reward. But I don't think that this is necessarily what Jesus is calling us to do, right? It's not checking off a list of good Christian things to do. So what does it really mean then to seek the kingdom of God? And I think to figure this out, we need to know what the kingdom of God even is. In the Bible, we read about this idea of past, present, and future. It's this idea of a past, present, future kingdom that's best described as already, but not yet. And we see this, we see this in a lot of different things. I'm going to be talking about this with the kingdom, but even if you look at what Christ is done on the cross with our salvation. We have this idea of being justified in the past, and um, now we're currently being sanctified. In the future, we're going to be glorified. We see this idea of something already being done, and then in the future, we have a promise, and we live in this current in-between, right? That's the present. I think this is true for the kingdom as well, that you have this idea of the past where Christ, after he died on the cross, we were justified and he began his kingdom. Um, He instituted parts of his kingdom. And that's why we call him Lord. Um, I think that Jesus is Lord of our lives or King of our lives right now. So we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, not of the world. And then in the future, we're going to be glorified with him and the kingdom of God will come to uh, dwell among man as God creates the new heavens and new earth. And so that will be um, something that happens in the future where we are made new and everything is made new. And so I think whenever we think about the kingdom of God, we think of this idea of the future tense of the gospel message, this idea of the kingdom of heaven, the future kingdom. But we always have to keep in mind how this past, present, and future kingdom of God works. We look forward to the future kingdom of God, but I think we also see God's kingdom now. 
And so if we're thinking about how we see the kingdom of God in the present day and age, I think the perfect image of this is in the first chapters of John and 1 John. I think if you look at John 1 and then 1 John 1, you can see how they kind of interplay against each other. In these passages, John is discussing how Jesus is the light sent from God to overcome the darkness of the world. And so because of the Holy Spirit living in us, we also kind of take on this persona of light that are sent from God into the world. And so through the work of the gospel, God has redeemed us from sin and darkness. And so our task is to go and go into the world and redeem it for God. So thinking about these analogies, Jesus then is like the dawn. He's the first whispers of the light of salvation. He's spreading across the horizon. And then we're currently living in this age of light where we are the light in the world. Um, because of the gospel, we're not, there is darkness in this age, but we are not in total darkness because Jesus has came as the light. So thinking about this, when Jesus returns in the end to set up his kingdom, the current order of things are going to be done away with. Everything's going to be made new and God himself will replace the sun and Jesus, the moon in the kingdom of God. And you can read about that in Revelation um, 23, 22. Um, so knowing these distinctions is essential to help us understand what we need to seek now. So obviously we have nothing to do with God setting up the physical kingdom that will return at the end of time. We have nothing to do with, uh, with what has already been done in the past. So what should we seek? Well, we seek the work of the kingdom now. So we're concerned with this present age, this present kingdom. And so what does this mean? Just like our analogy of light, we are concerned with spreading the gospel and combating sin. We're here to let God's light shine in the current age as much as possible, as much as we're able. Earlier in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 13 through 16, it says, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So I think to seek the kingdom now means that we must be about glorifying God and spreading the gospel. And so that's how we seek the kingdom of God now. To do this, though, we have to change everything about our lives so that we do good deeds and we glorify God. And so I think the three areas where we start is this. We change three things about our life. First, we change our priorities. Second, we change our habits. And third, we change our investments. And that is how we seek the kingdom of God now. So what we're going to do is we're going to break down these three different uh, ways that we need to change our lives so that we can seek the kingdom of God first. And we're going to focus on what each of those things mean. So the first way that we seek the kingdom of God is we must change our priorities in order to seek him. So uh, I was thinking about this and, you know, I dabble in a made from scratch life. You know, I am not by any stretch of the imagination, a full on homesteader, but I do, you know, do cloth diapers and I bake a little sourdough and sometimes I keep a garden, sometimes not. But what I've learned from this is you can create things from scratch and it doesn't really take any more, you know, money, especially, or even any more really effort, you know, sourdough total is probably about 15 minutes of, you know, work in the dough and then you have to bake it for like 30 minutes or something like that. But what it does take is time. For sourdough bread, you have to let it sit for like a day, sometimes a day and a half um, before it's ready to bake. So thinking about this, it just makes me think that I can only imagine how much time it took to, to do all of the daily tasks that were required of somebody that was living during Jesus's time. Yeah, they may not spend, you know, an hour or two in the car to and from work or for school drop-offs, but they did have to cook and sew everything by hand. And so it's no wonder that Jesus focuses on these two things that would probably dominate the focus of his audience. These are necessities that require a large investment of time. 
Jesus never said that we didn't need these things. But what he did say is that we need a uh, reordering of our priorities if we want to learn how to seek the kingdom of God. We've been talking about this a lot on the podcast recently. Our habits are determined by our goals and our goals are just extensions of our priorities. So when we seek God's kingdom first, we're reordering our priorities with God at the top. Importantly, this is not just some amorphous goal of, you know, God. <laughs> we have a direct command. We're not just talking about God where you say, okay, God is my first priority. Then you maybe have your marriage, then your kids. Whenever you do that, sometimes you don't actually give an action step. Jesus said, okay, your action is you are seeking the kingdom of God. So it's not just saying that this person is at the top. It's just like if you said, okay, maybe your second priority in life would be something to do with your spouse. Well, I could say, okay, my spouse is my priority, but if I don't give an action step, then I might not be moving in any way that actually helps my spouse. So it could be that you want to be supportive of your spouse. So if you're doing that, you might be making sure that, uh, you know, if you are the person who has the domestic responsibilities, you're cleaning up the house so that your spouse doesn't have to worry about that. Or maybe you're the person who's the breadwinner. Uh, so you're, you're taking care of those things. Or it could be that maybe your priority is that you want a closer relationship with your spouse. Well, that's going to have a whole different, uh, list of things that you need to do to have a better relationship with your spouse. Yeah, it could be taking care of some of those responsibilities, but it also could be that you need to have a monthly date night or something like that. So whenever you are thinking about your priorities, if you just say like a one word answer, so God, your kids, you may uh, not actually have an action step to those things, but Jesus gave us the action step. He said our action step is we need to seek the kingdom of God first. So we need to figure out what that looks like. We must seek God's kingdom and seek it first. And so I think having the kingdom of God as our priority means that we, one, pursue a life-giving, committed relationship with him daily, reordering our days to put him first. So we've talked about this uh, before, about how we you know, set up our morning routines and set up daily Bible reading um, so that we're consistently getting in the word and praying. I think, too, we also focus on actions that are consistent with good deeds or good fruit. So we have to live rightly and righteously to glorify God. And then also, number three, I think we need to spread the message of why we live differently by telling people about how the gospel of Jesus Christ has changed our lives. So these three things where we're, you know, looking at our relationship with God, looking at the actions that we do, and also um, ministering to others, these three things are how we seek the kingdom of God first. So again, it's not just saying, oh, God is my first priority and leaving it at that. These are, from, the, from that first priority, we have actions that, um, that happen. So that leads us to our next point that when we seek the kingdom of God, we also have to change our habits. So when we change our priorities, our days change. And so we have to align our everyday actions or our habits to match up with those priorities. So we've talked a lot about habits as well. And we know that our habits basically are just our forms of worship because they're things that we do every single day. And so we want to make sure that we're worshiping the right thing. And so if we are seeking the kingdom of God first, we want to make sure that we change the habits that we have to line up with some of the things we just talked about. So for instance, if you had a habit where you're, uh, we're staying up way too late, binging, uh, social media and then sleeping in the following day. And then you say, ah, I just don't have time to study my Bible. Well, maybe that would be a habit that you should change because you're not seeking the kingdom of God first if you're prioritizing staying up late and social media over spending time with God. You have to reshape your habits to make them match up with, your, with what your priorities are. I think some habits that you could think about including in your life that would uh, show that you're seeking God's kingdom first is daily Bible study and prayer both with yourself and with others, being involved in the church body. I think that's crucial for, um, for seeking God's kingdom first because his kingdom is the church. Um, being involved in service opportunities in your community and serving others, hospitality, family discipleship, family worship. Many of these habits involve actual actions that you do, but we also know 
that there are some habits that we have that are basically habits of our minds. And so you want to make sure too that your new habits, yes, we want to do it the ones that are actions, but we also want to change our heart so that it realigns with our priorities. So what this could look like is you may uh, start to have more gratitude. So you are choosing these things over other things. So you want to have a habit of gratitude and have that instead of a habit of being critical. Maybe you want to have a habit of trust instead of worrying or a habit of love instead of selfishness or a habit of grace and forgiveness instead of self-centeredness or maybe generosity instead of greed. So you want to change your physical and daily actions, but you also want to change the habits of your thought patterns. So instead of being critical and, you know, upset and divisive, you say, I'm not going to think about that. Instead, I'm going to choose to be grateful for something or instead of cycling uh, down in your mind into these places of worry, you say, you know what, I'm going to pray and then I'm going to trust God to give me what I need in this moment. This will help us as we try to seek God's kingdom. And I think that this leads us to our last point, which is that when we're seeking the kingdom of God, we also change our investments. So we begin to change what we place value on in our lives. I think food and clothing were um, some of the primary ways of showing wealth during Jesus's time. In addition to, you know, honor, giving people a seat of honor or showing them honor or deference. Um, But I think really food and clothing were probably some of the primary ways that people could kind of, uh, I guess, virtue signal or signal to other people that they were wealthy. Um, And so I think Jesus was telling his audience not to focus on these things. He was basically telling them to redefine what was valuable in their lives. Several of his other parables also focus on this. And what you can learn from these is that the most valuable thing is growing the kingdom of God, both in the importance that you place on it in your life. So you want to give more importance to the kingdom of God, but also you want to grow the kingdom of God in its actual numbers. You want more people to be added in to the family of God. So if we want to learn how to seek the kingdom of God, we must value place value on what matters in the kingdom. This means that we're going to put more time, money, and effort into making that thing grow. We're going to choose to invest in what will grow the kingdom, not in things that are passing in the world. And so it's interesting that the very things that the world would look at and say, if you have nice food or nice clothing, this would show that you um, are wealthy. It's interesting that those are the very things that are quickly destroyed in the world. We all know times that we've gone to the grocery store and spent way too much money on groceries only to spend the following week eating anything but those groceries. You bring it home, you're like, what did I even buy? And then a few weeks later, you open up the drawer and you find a lemon that's covered in mold beyond recognition because you never ate the groceries that you went and spent money on. Decay gets to all the things that you accumulate. It's the same thing where maybe you go and you buy a really nice uh, shirt or really nice jacket and you put it in your closet and then you look in your closet two years later and you're like, I think I wore that thing maybe three times and you spent way too much money on it. It's up to us to invest our time and money and effort into things that won't decay and break down. And so when we're thinking about this, what does it look like to invest in eternal things? I think if we look at how we are investing our money, we have to choose to focus on serving others. So you could give to the church or invest in experiences that spread the gospel and glorify God on earth. When you're investing your effort, you work for the ministry of God now. So you serve others, you spread the gospel, you do good deeds, you work in the church. You don't grow weary of doing good, but instead you work to spread the gospel now. When you're investing your time, you choose to make the most of your time on earth. We don't want to spend our our days in ways that don't add up to anything. We want to work for others and we want to spend time with others. We know the value of people for the kingdom of God. So in all of this, How do we seek the kingdom of God now? When we live with eternity in mind, it changes everything about our lives. 
we reorder our lives to put the kingdom of God first. And all of the things that we need in the world are added to our lives as a result. I think back to this past weekend, and it really was. It was a glimpse of the kingdom. We were in a beautiful place. We were surrounded by people who loved God. We were in community. We were breaking bread together. Or maybe, you know, it's just mac and cheese, but still we were enjoying God's creation. But a glimpse of the kingdom in this life now is always marred by the brokenness of the world. There's sickness, there's waste, there's rottenness, there's dirty camp bathrooms, there's campfires that won't stay lit, there's fish that won't bite. We recognize that God has placed eternity on our hearts, and we love those moments that help us to catch a vision of what our future will look like. It should help us to press on, to stay motivated, that despite the brokenness of the world, we are going to continue to work to redeem it for God. We're going to continue to be the salt and the light now. And that's how that we can seek the kingdom of God during our time on earth. I hope you enjoyed this podcast today. If you have, please leave a five-star rating and review. You can also comment here or on social media at A More Beautiful Life Collective to keep the conversation going. You can find our show notes and more at the blog at amorebeautifullifecollective.com. Join us next week for another episode. Thanks so much for joining me at a more beautiful life collective podcast. I hope you go and create a life you love and cultivate your heart for God. I'm Casey Fletcher and I hope you join me next week.